Welcome to the 354th Fighter Wing live coronavirus virtual town hall. Today is June 15th and this is our 13th update to the wing. I'm Kay Nissen and today we have with us Chief Loken, the 354th Fighter Wing Command Chief and Colonel Sean Anger, the 354th Fighter Wing Commander. While we're live, we'll be taking questions in the comments sections throughout the show, so please let us know what's on your minds so that we can give you guys the best information we have. Up first, as always, is the update, where we'll fill in all the changes from the last show. It's been about two weeks since our last show, and there are some changes that need to catch up on. So we'll start first, first with where we are with the COVID-19 numbers in the state of Alaska. According to the Fairbanks Daily News Miner over the weekend, Alaska recorded its highest number of COVID-19 cases Friday since the outbreak began in the state, with 29 cases announced Saturday by the Alaska Department of Health and Social Services. Among those positive tests were two residents from North Pole and one from Fairbanks. The borough has reported a total of seven new cases since last week. That's what's going on in the state and borough, but let's check in for some Ielsen Air Force Base specific updates. Colonel Anger, what's the latest for Ielsen? Yeah, so the latest, um, I think everybody's been tracking this relatively closely and seeing that uh, the state of Alaska has seen just a, a bit of a spike, which I guess you would expect. So we're trying to open, we, I guess the state is trying to open up for, uh, for business and try to still uh, take part in some of the tourist uh, boom that we normally get in the summertime. So with that, um, I think you're going to expect to see some increase in the numbers and the state of Alaska has certainly uh, seen that. Uh, primarily, this has happened down in the Kenai Peninsula as well in the Anchorage area. And for the most part, with the minor exceptions, the interior of Alaska has stayed relatively safe. And I think that is most, uh, mostly because the uh, uh, travel to the interior has not um, been prolific. Uh, with that being said, there has been a few cases recently in the local area to include the uh, North Pole area. So I am slightly concerned. We've also had some mission uh, cases in the Guam area, um, which is in 11th Air Force. And we've had crews that have transited from Guam to, uh, uh, to Isleson to execute some of, our, uh, some of our mission sets. So I am very aware and very concerned kind of with the local area and how things are going. Um, but for the most part, Isleson Airmen have been doing uh, relatively well uh, by maintaining their standard hygiene principles that we've been, uh, we've been pushing. However, we are start trying to get things to uh, whatever we consider the uh, the new normal. So I would say that for our <clears throat> where we are and where we're executing, we're at pretty close to the norm. So the FSS activities that are open are the ones that will be open for the foreseeable future. We'll continue to make small tweaks to allow um, us to refine our, t uh, our operations to try to get to the correct risk balance between getting after the things we need to get after, providing quality of life, but while preserving our mission and keeping our airmen and families safe. Um, so that's a delicate balance, and we're continuing to work to try to refine that. Uh, with that being said, we're, we're watching the spike that's happening really close, and if we see it start to go in the opposite direction, our airmen may see us retreat from some of the, I'll call them privileges, right? some of the things that we've opened up, we may have to retreat. And one of those um, that would be noticeable would be kind of the gym. So we take a fair amount of risk by opening up various portions of our gymnasium uh, inside of the Baker Field House, uh, knowing that uh, if a case were to get into the to the gym, uh, it could spread rapidly just based on the close proximity and the amount of touching that goes on inside the gym. Um, so with that, and I think Chief will talk a little bit more about that, we need to, especially the airmen that go in and are using the gym routinely, uh, to keep up our hygiene practices in the gym specifically in places we congregate close together. Uh, I think it's just a matter of time personally before an airman comes down with COVID. And uh, my hope is that our general hygiene practices are going to keep it isolated. Because um, the worst case is that airmen goes asymptomatic through their entire experience. And uh, the potential for them to share it with other airmen is quite high. And um, the only way that we can mitigate that case is uh, just by continuing to practice good hygiene practices uh, in our work areas. So uh, I also need our airmen to be exceptionally aware of their personal health. And if they start to feel uh, ill, uh, particularly some of the standard COVID symptoms, um, loss of smell or taste, uh, ex uh, elevated um, uh, temperature, et cetera, that uh, they need to just go in, go to um, uh, the med group and get tested. Uh, when you're symptomatic, you'll probably get tested. Uh, if you're asymptomatic and you're not uh, experiencing any symptoms, the CDC and our policy is still not to test. We don't have enough capacity to, to kind of widely test uh, the general population, so we're still not there yet. 
All right, one other thing I'd like to talk about, and I know it's a hot topic, is uh, our leave TDY and PCS policy. And it's really not the fighter wing policy. It really is the DOD policy translated down to Indo-PACOM, down to PACAF and, and Air Force in general. So there is a change coming. And you've probably, many of our airmen have seen it uh, through the Army Times, Air Force Times being passed down from the White House where they basically said they want to go to a conditions-based um, process so that some locations can have a little more autonomy on whether they go to um, leave and then that's outside the local area so this is being able to take leave down to the lower 48 and to see family member without it having to go to a three star for a uh, waiver um, based on it being a dire situation so usually for leave that was going to meet the emergency leave threshold there are plenty of good reasons to go visit family in the lower 48 that doesn't meet the emergency leave thresholds uh, and we want to be able to permit that um, but we're not quite there. And uh, so many have seen that there are locations that are considered green, all right? And there's states and regions and countries that are considered green. There is a second piece to that that we're waiting for uh, Department of the Air Force to provide us, which is the installation assessment. Okay. And for us, because we're within 50 miles of Wainwright, we're going to be lumped in together, uh, and our two installations need to be considered Screen before uh, we can implement those procedures. Um, I sent a note to all the commanders and the chiefs on the base uh, that talk about what those procedures will look like. And what you can expect is that commanders will have the authority, uh, if you are going from a installation green uh, location, which I'm hoping that Ileson will be, to another green installation, you will have, the commanders will have the authority to send them TDY to those locations and also allow them to take leave. Mm -hmm. Uh, it'll be a little bit risky because any time between that approval and the time that that airman leaves, that could be turned off if those conditions change and that location is no longer green. Mm -hmm. uh, this will come out in a command directive. It'll be very um, well detailed, uh, but there will be some amount of risk. So trip insurance in this case is probably uh, probably wise as we move into this new phase. As it always is. As it always is, yep. Uh, additionally, there's going to be a slight change to how we quarantine when we return. And I'm gonna, it will be more of a conditions-based quarantine based on the level of exposure and where you went, where you traveled through, will define the type of quarantine that you will do when you return. Uh, and this is for military members. As far as our civilian population, uh, a quarantine policy for the base will remain the same for family members and for uh, those that are coming out of the base. It's just a strict two week. If you've traveled outside the state, two week quarantine for those that don't have a mission related reason to have what I would call a modified quarantine that we will do case by case with uh, with the commanders. So mm -hmm. that's kind of what's coming down the pike. Uh, I hope this week that the Air Force will provide us the installation uh, listing of, of where that's at. And it, that is a function of input that I give, and I do that every week. So on Friday of every week, I make an assessment of our installation, and I push that uh, via website to the Air Force. I have yet just to, to receive the, the feedback that we need uh, to get after this change. Um, once I once we get that change, you can expect that I'm going to take all the command directives and we're going to rescind them all. And then we're going to put them back out in a uh, bit more concise and an easier to follow and execute uh, layout. But I want to package that all together in one big change. All right. Well, it sounds like there's a lot of changes that are potential and at least being discussed. So Absolutely. Thank you, sir. You're listening to the 354th Fighter Wing Coronavirus Town Hall. When we come back, we'll be taking your questions. So please drop some in the actual comments section. And we'll be back right after this.
Welcome back. You're listening to the 354th Fighter Wing Coronavirus Town Hall. I'm Candace and here with Chief Master Sergeant Loken and Colonel Anger. And it's time for rapid fire questions. Remember, you can post your questions in the comments section during our live show. But for now, I have a question to start with. I have heard that there are still areas of the gym that are closed and that there might be potential changes to what we're doing at the gym. Chief Loken, I think you might have an answer for us on what's going on there. Yes, ma'am. So there are, there are items and pieces of equipment and rooms that are still closed in the gym, and that's because we have to, we still want to take caution as we step out of this COVID crouch, and, uh, and we need to take it as slow as we can, as safely as we can, um, but getting the gym open was, it was important to, to turn Langer in the wing, and it was, we needed to get it done, but we need to keep it safe. So that being said, there are things we're still doing to every other cardio machine, but there are some more machines that are, have been moved into the, uh, the gymnasium floor. Um, and I want to reiterate about safety in the gym. We don't want this the privilege, as Colonel Anger said earlier, to, to go away. So we need to make sure that we're wiping in and wiping out. We, want, we need to make sure that we're deliberately cleaning the equipment, bef probably before and definitely after, after use, because you just don't want this to, to spike up and come back into the, into the wing at all, especially through that venue. So please, as you're at the gym, enjoy the gym, do what you can in there, but, but please, please, please be deliberate about cleaning the equipment and cleaning your hands um, for everybody else around you. I would also like to encourage uh, Group PT is, is, is now authorized, but at, at a squadron level, you probably ought to, as a squadron commander, if you're out there, take caution in that, and having a 200-man formation, even though you can socially distance, is probably not the smartest thing, so uh, the, I would encourage you to, to, to push it down to maybe the flight level for now. Um, and uh, it's a little bit easier to maintain that social distance when you have a smaller group. So yes, group PT is authorized, but please don't make it a huge formation. Um, so yeah, that's all, about all I have for it. Um, just be on the lookout for each other, keep each other safe, wash hands, wash equipment. Thanks, Chief. Yeah, I'll throw in on that too. That, uh, for us to be effective inside the gym, because there's a reasonable amount of risk associated with us trying to fully operate a, uh, the gym, is that it's an all-in all in, uh mentality that we need to have for hygiene. For instance, I, I was in there today, I was working out in the new gym area where they put a lot of the aerobic equipment and I didn't see any um, wipes at all in that entire gymnasium floor. So I went up to the, the desk and, and asked them, hey, we need to get gym wipes in there because you're, the expectation is that I wipe in and wipe out. And if I have to walk out to another room to get it, uh, let's be honest, it's, it's probably more than, I'm, than I want to ask our airmen to do. Um, I'm not saying that we're all lazy, but we have a workout that we want to get after. And if you're going to get in my way, I'm probably going to ch choose at times to not do it. So I do want to make it easy for our airmen uh, to follow the hygiene rules. Mm -hmm. And um, so I would ask that if you are hindered in your ability to maintain the uh, the hygiene that I'm asking you, then uh, put, either put in a nice comment, ask somebody at the front desk, um, do it nicely. All right. So we're all trying to get after this, show a little bit of grace and uh, we'll be able to get the things done that we need to because uh, I desperately want to keep the gym open uh, for as long as humanly possible, open up as much of it as possible. Um, I feel like we have all, and myself included, I was on quarantine because I did outside of the uh, Alaska travel for the last couple of weeks, and guess what? I didn't work out. Didn't work out the way that I would normally, and I used that as an excuse because it was difficult, and I imagine a lot of airmen uh, have done that over since March. And when I closed the gym or restricted it, the easy answer was, I'll just take a break. And when take a break turns into one, two, three weeks, a month, two months, and it really starts to feel it. I've, I feel better now than I have felt in weeks mm -hmm. because I've gotten to the gym and gotten just gotten the blood flowing. And man, it feels good. Um, but uh, we do need to take care of the gym. Okay. And um, I'm lockstep with Chief Loken on this. This is... It's very important to me. Um, and if I correct you in the gym, it's not because I'm trying to be a Nazi. I don't like police states, but I love the gym and I want it to stay open. It's very much like I do with uh, ATVs. If I find somebody not wearing protect PPE and an ATV, I stop them because what we have with some of these awesome privileges, I don't want to see go away. And sometimes apathy is, the, is, is our worst enemy. So keep at it. Appreciate it. Got it. Certainly still a team effort there at the gym. So next question that I was thinking actually was, what is the policy for dependents and civilian who work on base? Um, and, you know, if they go travel and they come back on, what is it that we're allowed to do to enforce? Because I've, I've heard around the wing that there have been reports of people traveling and maybe not taking that time to do a 14 day quarantine, which is right now the base guidance. That's right. So we don't have the ability uh, to 
basically comply with what the state is doing and, and bring testing into our um, into our quarantine plan. Uh, we don't have the capacity to do it. We don't have the CDC guidance to do it. Our med group isn't staffed or uh, have the equipment to do that. So we're sticking with our two-week quarantine. So any travel for any employee on this installation or anybody who's on this installation, uh, civilian, dependent, et cetera, must adhere to the two-week quarantine. Um, exceptions have particularly, as I am moving into the, what I would call a modified quarantine, we will do individually commander-based uh, to adjust for people that have mission critical needs to not spend two weeks uh, in a quarantine. That's assuming they, t they check themselves daily, they're asymptomatic, et cetera. But we're not there yet. So we are still going with uh, a two week quarantine for anybody on the installation who has traveled in the last two weeks, period. Okay. And how do we enforce that, sir? Hmm. Well, enforcement is multifaceted. Some of it is uh, the onus is on the individual. Mm -hmm. um, there are people who have access to the installation, um, clearly, who maybe are patrons of the retirees, patrons of services that exist on the installation, they need to be aware of it. So that's one piece of enforcement. And then uh, the lever that I have, which is a very big lever, is barment. So if I find out that you have deliberately not adhered to the two-week quarantine policy, I will bar you from the installation, period. Um, unfortunately, I don't have a lot in between that. From a civilian standpoint, military members, I have a little more authority and, le and leeway to work with military members, mm -hmm. uh, but with civilians, I don't. The only thing I can do, I, can, I don't have a discipline stick for that. Uh, all I have is barman, which is a heavy stick. So I would, uh, really what I do is I implore our um, retirees and civilians, dependents on the installation, to please adhere to the, uh, uh, the command directives and the quarantine procedures. It's for the better of the base, the population, and the mission. Um, and we do look after changes and try to update them as often as we can to accept just the right amount of risk um, in the current conditions. So I promise we're doing the best we can. Great. So we actually are receiving three questions right now that are all about the same thing. So Devin Snorick asking about family members visiting and staying on base. Bo Fritz asking about new guidance yet for families visiting from out of state and getting visitor passes. And Scott Farrell, any word on when trusted traveler will be back? So I think all of these questions, sir, just dealing with base access in general. Yeah. So uh, have there been any changes to base access? No, and I don't anticipate there being any change to base access. So right now, if you want to bring a visitor uh, who doesn't have base privileges on an installation, it requires a visitor pass. Visitor passes are authorized if approved by squadron commanders. So we have pushed this waiver authority uh, to squadron commanders. Now, if I was gonna have my family uh, come up to visit, that would be a pretty high bar to convince my commander that they're going to come onto the installation and quarantine for two weeks. And I'm not gonna have the level of contact that I would probably want to have if they come to visit. Well, you might ask, well, why even give the opportunity for the squadron commander to do that if the assumption is that would be very difficult? Well, I have seen distinct cases where it makes complete sense. We have airmen who are expecting a child and their in-laws are gonna come into town to provide help. They come in two weeks early, they quarantine in the basement, wherever, and then come out of that and then they operate like a normal uh, airman on the installation and they are able to provide that support after the child is born. And that is a perfect example of why in cases where I, I can't control every case, I don't, but if I give it to the commanders who are, uh, have more touch points than I do, they can have that individual consideration that unfortunately that I can't provide with a, with a base policy all the time. So what I'll tell you is, yep, you can try, but I wouldn't advise your family members to come uh, visit and expect them to be able to live on the installation and be able to have the kind of interaction that you expect to have when your family comes to visit. Now, if they want to stay off the installation, adhere to the state policies for quarantine when you come into the state. Um, that's up to you on how you execute that. Right. Okay. So good notes for that. I know a lot of people have yeah. been asking that question. It's unfortunately not the answer I think people want to hear, but right. uh, it's really at this point the, the right thing for our installation. Okay, we're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we'll be taking some more questions. I see a few more popping in. Uh, thanks for tuning in, and we'll be right back after this.
Welcome back to the 354th Fighter Wing Coronavirus Town Hall. We are here taking your questions. Thank you so much for dropping them in here. I'm seeing a few more come in. Um, sir, let's jump right in it. We, we missed this one from the beginning, but um, Trusted Traveler, that was a question specifically from before. Uh, can you give us a little bit of an update on if that's going to continue to not be happening? Yeah, so that will stay in its current condition, which is a, uh, temporarily suspended. And this is one of those issues where I link up with Wainwright and Jay Bear and try to keep our policies relatively consistent. Uh, we all exist in, rel in approximately the same environment here in Alaska. Uh, so I try to stay synced with them. I agree with uh, Colonel Chank down at Jay Bear that you know, they're not going to bring it back on. Uh, and I don't see a compelling need to bring it back here on uh, Ileson either. So you can anticipate that will stay in its current state uh, until we get to whatever the next state phase looks like in this corona response. Uh, I don't know what that looks like, but I promise you that we're going to continue to relook at them and uh, be as agile as we can be based on the environment. Got it. All right. Next question is from Gary Olson. What is the plan for when red flag happens and the state is still in quarantine status? And this actually relates a little bit to the fact that we have TDY airmen here right now. So what is it that we're advising our TDY airmen? Yeah, so even that policy has evolved over time. Um, we have, from the beginning, uh, the mission has not ceased. So we have had TDY air crew primarily on the installation through March and April, May, and into June. And if you've noticed, if you've come anywhere from uh, the Solcha area, you've probably seen the three very large aircraft that are on the ramp. Um, and they're a part of a bomber task force doing a rotational exercise, if you will, through Allison Air Force Base. So for each of these uh, visiting air crews, we've had to kind of adapt our policies to reflect uh, the individual circumstances of each unit. For instance, this unit came directly from their home station via contract air. Uh, so no contact with uh, our airport systems where quite frankly there has been a lot of COVID transmission. They came from a location that was uh, conditioned similar to ours as far as on-base infection rates. And so we uh, have to uh, determined through our public health and, and discussion that they're relatively low risk to the installation. And so we adjusted their quarantine procedures slightly to allow them a little bit of quality of life. They still can't use the gym, but they can go in and use some of the BX commissary uh, privileges so they can uh, execute their mission. Uh, they're, the missions they fly are unique. Some of them are exceptionally long. Uh, and so they have to be given a little bit of uh, consideration uh, for that. Um, same thing will happen with red flag. Um, so we're in constant communication with our PACAF counterparts. We have been given the green light to at least continue with our planning for red flag. And we certainly and we desperately need to get that uh, mission readiness bump that red flag uh, provides to our uh, friends and allies and our partners in the uh, Indo-Pacific region. So we're still pressing forward and we're going to do the exact same thing with those units. And we're going to treat them individually. We're going to try to put them on base to the max extent possible so we can control what we can control. Um, and then we will adjust and we may even mandate how they get here uh, so as not to fly through the airport system come in here through what we call gray tail so through a c-17 or a contract air carrier bring them directly from their installation directly to our installation mm -hmm. so we can uh, preserve that capacity now what we would like to do of course is we like to do some some amount of testing uh, on a representative sample to kind of make sure that we're how we're doing and we're still working through that coa um, but we will take very deliberate steps and it won't look like a normal red flag, unfortunately, from a social standpoint and ability to operate. But uh, we will be able to get after the world class training that red flag provides and still be able to keep our local population safe. OK, got it. So this is a follow up question that I see coming up right now from Devin Snorick and others about what happens if your family members adhere to the state policy off base and test positive when they're traveling, or test negative when they're traveling here. Is that enforcement of 14 days not able to come to the base still still intact? Absolutely, yeah. If you're not gonna do a 14 day quarantine, you have to stay off the installation period, Dad. Okay. Uh, if you test, have- Testing doesn't matter. Testing does not matter. Um, again, this is more of a, I don't have the ability to really control that, and I can't quantify whether it was, where that testing was done. I just don't have the capacity to uh, track that, so. Great, sir. So we're going to take a quick break here, and when we come back, we're going to be doing some last words. Stay tuned.
Welcome back. This is the Coronavirus Live Town Hall. We've answered your questions and now we're here for some last words with Colonel Anger and Chief Loken. So Chief Loken, I'll let you start with any last thoughts you might have for listeners today. I just want to say uh, say thanks for all of those people out there, the airmen, families, all that, doing, a, doing the right thing and, and continuing to, to keep themselves clean so that we don't get any sort of spike out here and just encourage everybody to keep keep doing that and stay at it. Like Colonel Anger said, that, that fitness center is a huge privilege and we don't want to see it go away. It's a huge morale builder for, for the whole wing. So please be conscious of that as you walk in and out of the gym. Awesome. Sir, your last words? You bet. Uh, I will say one thing. I know I brought it up about the bomber task force that's here and and I'm sure many people are wondering why, you know, why now, um, especially during COVID. Uh, if you've been watching in the news, we had what was called the Continuous Bomber Presence, or CBP, uh, that was stationed out of Guam. And we have uh, retreated from that. And uh, what that does is it causes a little bit of concern in the indo pacom region with our allies and partners um, who are used to that kind of level of interaction and engagement. So to keep up that interaction and engagement that we're certainly interested in doing here in the region, uh, they've shifted the way they do this continuous bomber presence to more of a periodic bomber presence, and they're using Allison as a uh, staging location. I think this is as much of a test uh, of anything to see if, hey, this is a good long-term COA that we can execute. Uh, what is unique about this bomber task force is that this unit is actually chopped to the 354th Fighter Wing. They report to me. Uh, I'm now an expeditionary bomb wing commander. Uh, these bombers belong to me. We report on them. They integrate into our operations and our maintenance groups, uh, which is really a cool thing. We haven't done that in a long time. It's really good for our processes. So we're really learning a lot by having them in town. Um, and then we'll uh, devise or derive a lot of lessons learned from this, this experience. And we'll use that for uh, later exercises and, and uh, operational plans. So um, treat them. If you, if you get to see them, ask them about what they do and and uh, get to know them a little bit. They are part of the 354th Fighter Wing for the duration of their, uh, of their stay. Uh, my last words, just like Chief Loken said, uh, thanks for what you're doing. Uh, I am I'm experiencing COVID fatigue like everyone else. Uh, it's, you know, when I forget to bring my mask or put it in the car, I'm like, you know, I, I have that same feeling that everybody has. And I humble myself and try, try to show a little grace. I'm doing this for everybody else. I'll wear the mask in places that I'm not forced to wear the mask. I wear it into the gym and out of the gym, but I don't wear it when I wake, work, work out. But I try my best to do what I can uh, to lessen the potential impact that if I've been exposed, uh, that I would share it with somebody else. And I generally treat, particularly if I don't know the individual and where they've been, I treat everybody as if they may have been exposed to lessen that impact to myself. Um, it's a burden, and I understand that but it's really our reality right now. And to, to continue to keep our base safe and to preserve our mission, um, I ask everyone to do those small things, as small as they may seem, uh, to keep ourselves safe and executable. Excellent, sir. All right, that's all the time we have today. Thank you everyone for tuning in. Please help us share this information by sharing the town hall recording, and we'll continue to answer questions in the comment section if you still have them for us. Thanks, Iceman team. Take care and stay healthy.